We described the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic properties of anti-infective agents used for the treatment of genital herpes, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis. Now let's explain the pathophysiology and clinical presentation of genital herpes, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis. Let's take a look at herpes simplex virus. Now when the virus enters the body through the skin or mucous uh, membrane, and that could be genital area or it could be essentially uh, anywhere where you have a mucous membrane. So, you know, you can think of the uh, oral cavity. Once the virus enters, it will essentially go into the nervous system and then it will have, uh, you know, initially uh, some, uh, you know, symptoms um, that will be uh, essentially on the skin. But once it goes to the nerve, it will have a period of latency. So it could be, uh, you know, many years that the virus will be inactive and then it will never uh, really leave the body. So there will be episodes of recurrence. So every time there is a reactivation of this latent uh, virus, uh, you know, there are two possibilities. One possibility, which we call recurrence, is that you will have uh, symptomatic manifestations. So there will be, for example, blisters on the skin and this will be a contagious phase of the infection because you know there will be uh, new viruses replicating inside the lesion and this can be transmitted to other people uh, by touch and the other possibility is asymptomatic viral shedding and this is essentially once the virus is reactivated it goes to the surface of the skin it's asymptomatic in the sense that it will not cause a symptomatic manifestation, so there will not necessarily be a lesion on the skin. But because the virus is ap actively replicating, uh, it will be able to uh, shed new viruses, and this is also contagious. And this causes a problem because, well, it's easy to avoid uh, transmission when there is an active lesion going on. People are um, you know unaware of asymptomatic viral shedding which is that they could um, you know there's not much they can do to prevent this transmission when they have asymptomatic viral shedding now of course the virus can uh, infect the orofacial area so you know uh, anywhere around the mouth and uh, you know inside the mouth and this uh, orofacial um, herpes is more common with hsv1 so between HSV and 2, uh, more likely to have HSV1 cause uh, this type of infection. And again, you know, regardless of whether it's HSV1 or 2, uh, the, uh, the course is um, essentially the same. There will be an, um, a period of latency followed by sporadic reactivations. Now, it can also lead to uh, genital HSV infection and you know this could uh, be both men and women and when it comes to genital HSV it is uh, more common to have recurrences with HSV2 but again uh, either HSV1 or 2 can cause um, um, uh, genital herpes it's just that it's more likely to have recurrences with HS HSV2 uh, HSV1 uh, just doesn't rec recur uh, that often uh, in the uh, genital area. Now, another thing to note about this virus is, is that although, you know, someone may have genital um, HSV infection, it may not necessarily be uh, limited to that region. So even if the route of transmission was uh, sexual transmission, extra genital lesions may occur during the course of uh, primary genital infection. So extra means outside of genital lesions. Now, uh, another uh, possibility is eye infections, so ocular infections with HSV. They're not as common, but they can occur and they can be uh, pretty much uh, serious. And uh, lastly, um, encephalitis can occur from HSV. So this is essentially infection in the CNS system. And, um, you know, that's something that um, also can happen with HSV. Now, let's take a look at some of the manifestations of genital HSV infection specifically. So one thing to note is that the incubation period is about uh, one week, so four to seven days. So essentially, once somebody is exposed, it will take about a week for symptoms to develop. And for the initial infection is essentially lesions that appear 
uh, you know, um, at the site of transmission. So typically the genitals or the adjacent skin. For the initial infection, it's usually uh, the lesions are bilateral. Uh, so there is some symmetry. And, uh, you know, essentially the lesions uh, progress from erythema to papules to vesicles to ulcers that ultimately develop a crust. And, you know, without treatment, this essentially resolves over two to three weeks. And half of the patients report other systemic symptoms, so such as, uh, you know, headache, fever, malaise, dysuria, uh, or, um, you know, lymphadenopathy. After a period of latency, there will be recurrent uh, genital disease, so essentially reactivation, um, you know, which result either in symptomatic or asymptomatic viral shedding. Symptomatic recurrence may be uh, preceded by localized prodromal uh, symptoms, so sometimes people can tell if uh, a recurrence is coming up, they can sense itching or tingling. So prodromal, uh, essentially if you look at this picture over here, uh, you know, um, the first phase of the infection is incubation period. Then the second phase is uh, prodromal period. That's before the symptoms actually become visible. So, you know, prodromal is that just, you know, just before the symptoms uh, come up. And that's, uh, you know, significant because if somebody anticipates that symptoms are coming up, they may choose to uh, proactively uh, start treatment. Uh, and at the same time, uh, prevent transmission by uh, practicing, um, uh, you know, caution. As I mentioned, recurrence is less frequent with HSV-1 compared to HSV-2. So keep that in mind when we decide, you know, when to, um, you know, when we decide treatment for these. And, uh, you know, they typically, the recurrences resolve uh, within 5 to 10 days. Now, chlamydia and gonorrhea manifestations are pretty similar. So uh, for chlamydia, it could be a symptomatic infection uh, among both men and women. Uh, and in general, you can think of, uh, you know, urogenital as site of infection. So this will be pain or burning during urination, discharge from the vagina or penis uh, and pain or swelling in the testes. Uh, the second, and, and these are, you know, depending on the route of uh, sexual intercourse is where you would get these different manifestations. So, you know, for the rectal and anal, you will have rectal bleeding or anal discharge, painful bowel movement. And then outside of your genital and rectal, you, you know, you can have um, conjunctivitis. And in severe cases, uh, you can have joint pain and swollen lymph nodes. Now, when we look at gonorrhea, again, asymptomatic infection is common among women until complications occur. Um, you know, for, for men are more likely to be symptomatic, so it doesn't uh, list men here. Um, you know, gonorrhea, very symptomatic in men. And again, the same routes, right? So urogenital, again, similar, um, you know, symptoms uh, for each route, so rectal and anal. And then one thing that's uh, you know a little different between gonorrhea and um, chlamydia is that uh, chlamydia, when you know, for example, if you consider the oral route of um, transmission, uh, chlamydia is less likely to cause sore throat, whereas gonorrhea is more likely to cause sore throat. So sore throat is uh, you know pharyngitis, I should say, uh, is um, you know more of a possibility for gonorrhea. And then, of course, conjunctivitis and gonorrhea can uh, be uh, pretty severe when it gets to disseminated uh, gonococcal uh, infection. And then lastly, we will go over syphilis, so manifestation of syphilis. So it's important to think of syphilis as different phases. So we have primary syphilis, secondary and tertiary. Primary syphilis essentially is, uh, you know, when someone is, uh, has just been exposed and, you know, it, typically uh, three weeks later, they're gonna have the very first symptom, which is at the site of transmission. So typically a single ulcer, uh, or sometimes it might be multiple lesions, uh, typically on the genitals area, and that essentially marks uh, primary uh, syphilis. Now, sometimes these are missed because although there will be lesions, these are painless. So if somebody doesn't notice it because there is no pain, it's possible for them to miss this. 
Now, when we get to, uh, you know, assuming this is not treated, uh, you know, this will resolve on its own, but the infection doesn't go away. So this, these ulcers will go away, they will heal. And, uh, you know, about six to eight weeks later, there will be a secondary syphilis. So this is essentially a little more severe. So there will be, uh, you know, because the bacteria will grow everywhere in the body. So some of the manifestations that come up next include fever, headache, and uh, rash, um, you know, especially when you see specific circular rash, uh, small rashes uh, on the flank, shoulders, arm, chest, or back, uh, and typically on the palms of the hands or soles of the feet. And then after the secondary syphilis is resolved, you know, assuming again, no treatment, uh, then the infection goes into a latent phase and this is, uh, you know, pretty, um, you know, it can be pretty long in some patients. So anywhere between, um, you know, a few years to many years and uh, the latent. So typically we say um, the early latent um, is uh, the, within the first year and then late latent is anything more than a year. And uh, after the latency is over, at some point it will develop into tertiary syphilis. And this is where you get the very severe complication. So typically involving the, uh, the heart. So it can cause cardiovascular disease, uh, but also neurologic conditions. And uh, neurosyphilis specifically, which typically occurs as tertiary syphilis, it can really happen at any time. So even someone who has primary syphilis, it's, it's not as common, but someone with primary syphilis can uh, develop neurosyphilis pretty quickly. Uh, and you know, neurosyphilis uh, can damage the brain. So this is something that needs to be treated seriously. And uh, here's a picture that essentially shows you uh, what I described. So once somebody has uh, infection, uh, they will develop primary syphilis and that takes about uh, two to six weeks to develop after infection uh, so you know those are the local uh, symptoms now from at any time this can make its way into the cns and cause uh, syphilis uh, i mean neuro neurosyphilis um, with uh, primary uh, you know typically it goes to secondary for some uh, for some patients, they, this actually may go to late latency instead of developing those rash. Uh, so, you know, not everybody will have uh, this secondary syphilis infection. So, uh, so, you know, for that reason, it's easy for people to miss because the primary syphilis, uh, you know, these lesions are painless. So, you, people may miss it. And then if it goes straight to early uh, latent, um, you know, later on, it will go unnoticed to develop tertiary syphilis, which is, uh, you know, uh, severe complications. And that's one of the reasons that the rates of syphilis uh, are uh, increasing significantly in recent time.